The Importance of Circadian Rhythms in Gut Health by Dave Mayo at HackYourGut.com The purpose of this module is to help you understand why circadian rhythms are important for gut health. Circadian rhythms have a tremendous impact on your overall physiology, but on your gut health in particular. In this module, we'll answer the following questions. What are circadian rhythms? How are they controlled? What are clocks and why are they important? What do they do for us? Why should you care? How do circadian rhythms impact gut health? Why you must address circadian rhythms first before any therapeutic protocol? And areas where you may be making mistakes. What are circadian rhythms? Circadian rhythms are daily variations in hormones, neurotransmitters, and the cell cycle that help adapt an organism to its environment. Circadian rhythms are controlled by clock genes found in every cell you have. As such, nearly every hormone in your body follows some form of regular circadian variation. Great examples of this include cortisol, insulin, thyroid hormone, melatonin, ghrelin, leptin, estrogen, and testosterone. It should come as no surprise then that nearly every system in your body can become disrupted when circadian rhythms are off. The stress response, metabolism, sleep, appetite, energy levels, fertility, and of course digestion. This chart shows circadian variation in cortisol release. One of the primary effects of cortisol is to cause you to become aroused and alert in order to interact with your environment, whether you're trying to fight or flee a predator or you're trying to find food. As such, during the night when you're supposed to be sleeping, cortisol levels tend to be very, very low and they begin to rise until they reach a peak first thing in the morning. Throughout the rest of the day, cortisol levels begin to decline until they reach their bottom again as it's time to wind down and begin to go to sleep. This graph shows the circadian variation in melatonin production in the pineal gland. You may have heard of melatonin as it's associated with sleep. Typically the way it works is during the day when sunlight is hitting your eye, the pineal gland is blocked from releasing melatonin. As you get towards the night and the sun goes down, the light's no longer hitting your eye and the pineal gland begins to produce melatonin, which helps you wind down for the night. It's essentially a signal from the environment that it's time to go to sleep. Throughout the night, melatonin levels increase until they reach their peak, and then they hit a bottom in the morning when it's time to wake up. This graph shows the circadian variation in cortisol and melatonin production superimposed on one another. As you can see, during the day when you should be awake, alert, and physically active, cortisol levels tend to be high while melatonin levels tend to be low. At night, when it's time to wind down and go to sleep, melatonin levels are high while cortisol levels are low. Obviously, these two hormones work in concert with one another to help us be awake and or asleep depending on which one's high and which one's low. In this way, the way you feel during the day or the night is dependent on both. How are circadian rhythms controlled? Environmental cues called zeitgebers help set your circadian rhythms. These zeitgebers or time givers include light, food, pharmaceutical drugs, temperature, social interactions, and physical activity and exercise. They help adjust your body's rhythms to the environment to optimize evolutionary success. And of course, from an evolutionary perspective, success means attaining food and having the ability to reproduce. Zeitgebers stimulate the production and or secretion of signaling molecules, hormones, neurotransmitters, and such, that interact with cellular components to set circadian rhythms. Genes involved in this include clock one, BMO1, which is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, period, and cryptochrome. What are clocks and why are they important? There are basically two types of clocks. The master clock, which is an area of cells in the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain that really isn't a master clock, 
Ideally, it's synced to the peripheral clocks, but it doesn't need to be. And then you have the peripheral clocks, which are clocks and organs that respond to the environment in a circadian way. This includes the liver, muscle, gut, the microbiome, adrenals, pancreas, and adipose tissue. Ideally, these clocks are synced to one another, but they don't necessarily have to be. But in general, when the master clock is synced to the peripheral clocks and the peripheral clocks are synced to one another, you're going to get the best biological response. Disrupted clocks are associated with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, anxiety and depression, and possibly autoimmune diseases. So what do our circadian clocks do for us? Basically, they help us physiologically adapt to our environment, especially when there's a pattern involved. For example, if food only became available at night, it wouldn't be beneficial to us to be sleeping at that time. So our circadian patterns and rhythms would shift in a way that would cause us to be more alert and physically active when our normal sleep pattern would be. So in this way, they regulate alertness, metabolism, sleep, feeding behavior, and activity levels in order to help us gain food and to gain a biological advantage. With regard to syncing our peripheral clocks, Things such as blood glucose are dependent on these clocks communicating with one another. For example, the gut regulates glucose absorption from food, the liver regulates blood glucose output, the pancreas regulates insulin secretion, and fat and muscle uptake glucose from the blood. Any one of these clocks being disrupted is going to cause blood glucose levels to be high or low. And that's not a good thing. You want these clocks communicating with one another so something like our blood glucose levels stay in a healthy range. In general, syncing your master clock to your peripheral clocks is the best option. A great example of this is appetite. The stomach secretes ghrelin when fasting. Ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone because when it gets to the brain, it basically says, hey, I'm hungry. Let's mobilize this energy. Adrenals get working, muscles get working, let's go find food. Leptin kind of works in the opposite manner. It tells the brain, okay, I'm full. It's released from fat cells and helps regulate the fat mass and metabolism in the brain. Ultimately, syncing the clocks ensures that proper messages are sent and received between distant tissues. And at the cellular level, clock genes help regulate the cell cycle. This is important for cell turnover and tissue integrity. Imagine if all the cells in your gut just decided all at the same time, all right, let's turn over. Not a good idea. So why should you care about syncing up your circadian clocks? Any sort of hormonal issue could be caused by circadian disruption or poorly synced clocks. Thyroid disorders, type 2 diabetes, HPA access dysregulation, also known as adrenal fatigue, poor sleep, poor skin quality, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, hair loss, fertility, obesity, poor weight loss, and autoimmune disease. For example, as I mentioned earlier, your pancreas can be pumping out insulin and your liver can be making blood glucose, but if your muscle and fat tissue aren't putting forth the receptors to take insulin and blood glucose in from the blood, then your insulin and blood glucose levels will remain higher than they should. The science behind circadian clocks has bred a few sub-disciplines, including chrononutrition, which is kind of like syncing up your food intake to help with many of these issues, um, or to try to improve your gut health. Chronopharmacology, which is the timing of pharmaceutical drugs or therapies, to vastly improve outcomes and limit side effects. There is substantial evidence for this uh, in the use of chemotherapy for cancer, uh, for asthma and allergy drugs, for drugs for hypertension, as well as the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Chronopharmacology can also help deal with the effectiveness and side effects of herbal supplements, antimicrobials, and teas, because these are pushed through the same detoxification pathways as pharmaceutical drugs, and these are under circadian influence. In theory, timing your vaccines could produce fewer side effects as well, again, through the same detoxification pathways. 
Certain viruses are also more virulent at certain times or take the opportunity to infect you when your clock genes are disrupted. You probably experienced, if you have uh, herpes simplex 1, you probably experienced a night going out, partying with your friends, not getting sleep, waking up the next morning, boom, you got a cold sore. That's because your circadian clock was disrupted. Additionally, some viruses hijack clock genes in order to infect. Again, the herpes family of viruses, including chicken pox, oral herpes, or genital herpes, as well as the flu virus, to name a couple. Food sensitivities could also be caused by circadian disruption. Things like salicylates and polyphenols are pushed through these same detoxification pathways, and while normally they produce a healthy effect, if these pathways aren't working properly, they can accumulate and cause ill effects. How do circadian rhythms affect gut health? The gut is under heavy circadian influence. The integrity of the intestinal barrier, in other words, how tight your gut is, happens to change throughout the feeding and fasting cycle. Inflammation as well tends to be blocked during certain periods of the day and detoxification enhanced. Generally speaking, when we're in our feeding pattern, the intestinal barrier tends to be tighter, inflammation tends to be blocked, and detoxification tends to be enhanced. And if you think about it, it makes sense. When you're feeding, you would want the gut to be tighter, you would want less inflammation, and you'd want to enhance detoxification because you're being exposed to more toxins, bacteria, and polyphenols that are processed through those pathways. Motility and enzyme secretion are also regulated in a circadian manner. Motility patterns tend to be different between the fed and the fasting state. During the fed state, Motility tends to be more about helping digest your food by grinding it and churning it. And during the fasting pattern, it tends to be more about moving it along the small intestine for absorption and into the colon for elimination. Enzyme secretion as well. Enzymes tend to be secreted more when you're eating, obviously, but these enzymes are synthesized and stored during the fasting period. And a lot of this has to do with anticipatory reactions. Uh, when you get close to eating your meals, if you're doing this in a regular uh, schedule, you will tend to prepare yourself in a way to digest and absorb your food better. The microbiome is regulated in a circadian manner. And a lot of this has to do with what's going through it. In other words, when you're feeding, the internal environment is completely different. The pH is different. Uh, what's going through is different. Whether you know how things are moving is different. And during the fasting state, you tend to have a shift. In that way, you will actually see a shift in the microbiome between feeding and fasting. And an interesting thing of note is this will tend to increase the diversity of your microbiome because you're going to have a lot of different. Uh, microbes living in your gut depending on when you're feeding and fasting. If you're never in a fasting state, then you're never going to really uh, have a big bloom of the uh, microbes that would tend to proliferate during the fasting state. Bile as well is under heavy circadian regulation and that will impact the microbiome too. And all signs point to physical activity and the feeding fasting cycle heavily regulating bile output. If you don't have a fasting cycle, your bile output will tend to be lower. Why you must address circadian rhythms first before any therapeutic protocol. Circadian rhythms dictate how much of a pharmaceutical drug, herb, or supplement is absorbed and how quickly it's removed from the body. This greatly impacts efficacy and side effects. Approaches meant to optimize the function of a circadian system are time specific and if your circadian clocks are off, you need to know how to take that type of supplement or pharmaceutical drug in order to get them back on track. Good examples are melatonin for gut health or if you're taking some sort of supplement for adrenal support or thyroid support. Syncing up your clocks may also be the more appropriate therapy in and of itself. High cholesterol, high blood glucose, poor sleep, poor bile output, and lower high blood pressure may be symptoms of circadian disruption and not necessarily the issue you're trying to fix. This can help prevent you from chasing symptoms. Areas where you may be making mistakes. Improper light exposure from lights and screens late at night can disrupt your master clock. Blue blocking glasses or avoiding blue light before bed are a good start, but it's only a start. 
you want to adjust your light exposure to when you want to go to bed and when you want to wake up. An additional important factor is the length of time you block blue light, since melatonin is an antioxidant and it is produced when you're blocking this light. More melatonin can help repair any free radical damage that you may have incurred during the day. Eating too late or too early are also major issues, as is taking too many supplements or taking them at improper times. Supplements and teas should be time restricted. You shouldn't just be taking them throughout the day. Getting physical activity at inappropriate times or not at all is a big issue, and I would tend to lean towards people not getting enough physical activity as being the primary issue. Physical activity is a substantial zeitgeber. Probably the biggest issue for everyone is not putting all of these things together, like this guy. Once I started putting all these things together and forming a more comprehensive plan, I saw much better results. Conclusion. Circadian rhythms and syncing your circadian clock should be something everyone puts a good amount of emphasis on, for general health as well as improving health conditions. Gut function is under powerful circadian influence. We're looking at processes such as digestion, absorption, detoxification, and the microbiome. Generally speaking, you want these things to be turned on during part of the day, but you also want them to be turned off so they can be repaired and so that they can be ready to be used the next day. Any therapeutic approach will likely be affected by circadian rhythms, both the efficacy and the side effects. You can manipulate sleep, feeding, and physical activity to optimize gut health or to enhance any therapeutic results used to improve it. So what's next? I've developed a program to help set your optimum light exposure, activity times, and feeding fasting schedule, and this will be highly individual. The purpose is to promote good sleep, effective recovery from daily stressors, both physical and mental, and optimize your health. Additionally, to avoid conditions associated with circadian disruption, such as neurodegenerative diseases, insomnia, anxiety and depression, fatigue and muscle pain, gut problems, and HBA axis dysregulation. This can also optimize the effectiveness of any therapeutic approach you may be taking currently. The layout of this program will be PowerPoint videos such as this one, instructional videos, as well as PDF files. I'll be running this program for a month in a private Facebook group to help facilitate and answer any questions and guide people. For more information, you can ask to join the Hack Your Gut private Facebook group at the link provided.